Almost two decades since officially formed, United Launch Alliance, one of the world's most important rocket companies, is on the threshold of doom. It may be sold later this year. So how did Elon Musk's SpaceX bring ULA from glory to the abyss? This is the ULA failure. ULA was born in an unlikely marriage in 2006 when the Pentagon allowed Lockheed and Boeing to form a joint venture that gave the newly formed company, ULA, a monopoly on all military launch contracts. At the time, the Pentagon was focused on assured access to space, emphasizing reliable rockets that would fly successfully over cost. ULA essentially operated as an arm of the Pentagon while raking in billions of dollars. However, SpaceX tried to prevent the union, filing a lawsuit attempting to block the creation of ULA by arguing that it destroyed any pretense of competition. The suit went nowhere, but a decade later, SpaceX was back in court, and this time it had not only flown its Falcon 9 rocket to orbit, but had contracts with NASA to fly cargo and supplies to the International Space Station. If its rockets were good enough for NASA, SpaceX argued they should also be good enough to compete for the Pentagon launches that ULA had locked up. Musk went on the offensive, relentlessly attacking ULA's primary weakness, the fact that it relied on an engine manufactured in Russia. Our toughest competitor on the international launch market is the Russians, and the U.S. Air Force sends them hundreds of millions of dollars every year for Russian engines, Musk said at the time. It's super messed up. This time, SpaceX won. The Pentagon settled the suit and SpaceX gained a foothold in the national security launch market. ULA's board then fired the CEO Michael Gass and hired Tory Bruno, who at the time was overseeing Lockheed's missile defense systems. When Tory Bruno accepted the offer to lead the faltering company, which had just ousted its CEO, he knew what he was getting into. Bruno made moves to remake the company with the sole purpose of battling SpaceX. He laid off 30% of ULA's staff and took steps to unite what he said were two companies, one that worked on the company's Atlas V and the other that worked on the Delta rockets, with separate lines in the factory and, of course, separate launch pads, he said, but also separate teams, separate management structure, and to a large extent, even separate accounts. It was a massive overhaul, and he had to do it while maintaining ULA's successful launch record. He pitted suppliers against each other, making them compete, and then giving each much more volume, but only if they would cut price. He also decided the company couldn't just sit back while Musk and SpaceX gobbled it up. We had to take the fight to the competitors, Bruno said. You can't ignore the other guy and let that company do whatever they want and have an open playing field. He also knew he had to get ULA off the Russian-made RD-180 engine. And then came an unusual marriage, Blue Origin, a startup that had been secretive about its ambitions, and ULA, the big defense contractor that represented the military-industrial complex. But they both wanted to see the engine which Blue planned to use in the New Glenn rocket come to fruition. I think the U.S. needs to have an American-made booster engine. And finally, I think for humanity we need access to space, said Jeff Bezos when he and Bruno announced the partnership, and that was in 2014. This will move all those things forward, and I feel great about it. Bezos and Bruno hit it off, two space geeks with a deep knowledge of rockets and how they work. I was surprised the first time I sat with him, Bruno said of Bezos. I don't think I would hurt his feelings if I said that, but I was very surprised at how well-versed he was in the technology. We kind of hit it off right away. We had the mutual passion for space and rocketry. He's the real deal. He's not faking it. As a result, in 2018, Bruno selected Blue Origin over Aerojet Rocketdyne, but the deal has not worked out as well as he'd hoped. At the time of the initial agreement, Blue Origin said the BE-4 would be ready for flight by 2017, but it was not ready until last year when Blue Origin completed the delivery of BE-4 rocket engines for the first ULA Vulcan launch. Publicly, Bruno's maintained a professional posture, saying he had confidence in the team at Blue and they would deliver, but privately, he was frustrated with the delays and pressured Blue to get the engine ready. After having engines, ULA now hopes that Vulcan can fly in May. Perhaps most significantly, it recently signed a contract for 38 launches to help install Amazon's Kuiper Internet Satellite Constellation into orbit as part of the largest commercial launch contract ever. 
That's on top of nine launches it had previously won and gives ULA a new line of commercial business that could sustain it for years as Bruno seeks to give ULA a solid footing for the future. Vulcan is much less expensive than the Atlas V that currently flies, Bruno said. As the flight rate goes up, there are economies of scale, so it gets cheaper over time. And of course, you're introducing reusability, so it's cheaper. It's just getting more and more competitive. Well, that's the theory anyway, but with Starship, SpaceX could disrupt the market yet again and continue to dominate the industry. Amazon has also hired Blue Origin and Arian Space, the French rocket company, to launch batches of its satellites. And the space industry has gone through enormous change since Bruno took over at ULA. There's other U.S. competitors coming up as well, including Blue Origin, Rocket Lab, and Relativity Space. Now, none of these are a near-term threat to ULA, but in five to ten years, one or more of those companies could have a fully reusable rocket priced substantially below that of Vulcan. ULA still faces and will continue to face significant challenges. Matthew Weinzerl and Brendan Rousseau, who teach space economics courses at Harvard Business School, they wrote that in an email to the Post. Even with ULA's heritage, certifying a new launch vehicle is no easy feat. It is still rocket science after all. And even if the Vulcan's early flights go well, ULA's competition, many of whom are nimbler and more vertically integrated, will not be standing still. Indeed, last week, Ars Technica spaceflight reporter Eric Berger writes, the prominent launch provider ULA is up for sale, and that investment firm Morgan Stanley and consulting firm Bain & Company are overseeing the transaction. Three unnamed sources reportedly confirmed to Berger that potential buyers have been contacted about the opportunity, and the sale could happen in the coming months. Parent companies Boeing and Lockheed Martin are remaining tight-lipped on the matter, independently saying they don't comment on potential market rumors or speculation about financial activity. The potential sale of ULA comes with many questions for a buyer. Foremost among them is likely to be the long-term viability of the traditional space company at a time when SpaceX has taken a dominant position in the global launch industry. Another important factor in ULA's viability is its need for investment. Over the last two decades, the parent companies have tended to pull profits out of ULA rather than invest in the development of new technology. Vulcan, for example, was developed largely with money from the U.S. military. The Department of Defense supported the development of Vulcan engines and solids and provided development grants worth about $967 million directly to ULA. To become competitive in the new era of commercial launch, a new owner will likely need to free ULA to innovate and provide the funding to do so. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Don't forget to share your ideas in the comment section down below. Everyone's support motivates us to create more quality video. And for that, we thank you so much and hope to see you next time.